In this video, we're going to introduce the concept of solubility. And uh, so solubility is the maximum amount of a solute that can be dissolved in a, sol in a solvent. So, um, so basically, solubility describes how much stuff you can fit into a solution, or how much solid uh, you can fit into a aqueous solution, for example. But remember, solutions can be have solutions can have the solvent can be in any form, gas, solid, or liquid. Um, but in the case of what we're going to be talking about, generally speaking, we're going to be talking about dissolving um, solutes into water, which is a liquid solvent. But uh, solubility is the maximum amount of solute, solute that can be dissolved in a solvent. And so what happens is, is when you reach the solubility, if you keep adding solid into that solution, you're going to create an equilibrium. And what we say is that saturated solutions... are in equilibrium. And the equilibrium is between the solute in the solid form and the solute in the dissolved form, which is the aqueous form. So in essence, you can kind of think about your beaker here. And uh, up here is an aqueous solution of your uh, solute. And down here, you might have some uh, solute that's in the solid form. And um, these two things are going back and forth. So some solute is some of the solid is dissolving into the solution, while some of the aqueous uh, solute is sort of precipitating back out. And that equilibrium uh, represents what happens at saturation. Typically, the value for solubility is given as uh, with units of grams of solute per 100 mils. That's kind of common units. Although it can, it can range, and it kind of depends uh, on what you're talking about. It could be grams of solute per liter, grams of solute per 100 mils. Um, it could be micrograms of solute per mil or something like that if it's really insoluble. But generally speaking, the most common units are um, grams per uh, 100 mils of solute. And, and the key thing is that you have to understand that it's sort of a mass divided by a volume uh, and that's how we define a concentration. And we're going to look more specifically at different units of concentrations in, a, in the next video. Now, there are two other terms that kind of go along with this. Um, we have a term called unsaturated. So unsaturated is a concentration that's less than a saturated solution. And then we can have a rare metastable circumstance, which is where we, what we call supersaturated. And so the concentration of a supersaturated solution would actually be greater than the saturation level. And typically, this is, this is what we would consider to be metastable. It's, um, it's not something that is formed naturally. Uh, most often, these solutions are formed by heating something up to get it to dissolve. And then you kind of gently cool it back down and don't allow it to precipitate out spontaneously. And oftentimes, these solutions, if you shake them or if you just introduce a small amount of solid, they will rapidly uh, and sort of dramatically crystallize out. So in terms of factors that affect solubility, there are some common things that we're aware of. And, you know, this is the uh, nature of the solute and solvent. And so I'm not going to go into very much detail here because we discussed this already uh, in some detail. But this, generally speaking, is what we would call, you know, uh, what we would consider to be like dissolves like. So, you know, what we're talking about here are things like uh, polarity, um, and uh, basically polarity. So we have things that are polar, um, and polar things will dissolve other polar things, and we have things that are nonpolar, and those will tend to dissolve things that are nonpolar. Um, so solute-solvent interactions sort of depend, and we talked about those. Um, those can range from things like um, hydrogen bonding to pol polar bonds to um, London dispersion forces. Now, the second thing that we can talk about, and this is where we're going to spend more of our time, is um, energy considerations in ionic compounds. And so really there are two things that sort of determine the strength at which an ionic compound is sort of held together and the energy at which um, an ionic compound um, is sort of, the, the energy of which ions um, form intermolecular interactions with water, and that's called hydration. So the first one that we're going to think about is lattice energy. And the formal definition of lattice energy, so for example, the lattice energy for sodium chloride solid would be the amount of energy it takes to completely break apart the 
uh, ionic bonds, uh, and we go from the sodium chloride solid, where all of the, so the sodium and chloride ions are neatly packed into their solid form. Each one forms all of its possible ionic bonds with its surrounding um, ions. And then we, we basically rip all those bonds apart. Um, we completely separate the ions and break all of those ionic interactions. Uh, and then we form the ions in the gas phase. So in essence, we're breaking all of the, the ionic bonds in the lattice. Um, so lattice energy is really important. And generally speaking, you know, it takes energy to break these apart. So delta H for these things are usually typically very large numbers because of the strength of the ionic bonds. So this is a very endothermic process. And it's something that we have to overcome when we, when we dissolve something. So if you remember, when we're dissolving a salt, what we're basically doing is, is we're going from NaCl solid to Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. And so you can see that one of the major things that happens in here is we separate those ionic bonds. So one part of this uh, dissolution is that we basically separate the sodium um, from the chloride in the ionic network. So the lattice energy is something that we have to overcome, and that's a fairly big and endothermic burden on this process. And then the other one that we have to think about is hydration energy. And so hydration energy is the attractive force that forms between um, the water molecules and the ions. So when we go from sodium plus, for example, in the gas phase to sodium plus in the aqueous phase, something happens here that helps to reduce the energy. So delta H here is going to be a minus. And what basically happens is when we put the ion into water, the water molecules are polar and they have slight negative charges on one side and slight positive charges on the other. And so the water molecules can line up and interact with the sodium ions and sort of stabilize their charge. In essence, what you can think of this is you, you can kind of think of the water molecules as replacing the chlorides. And the same thing happens with Cl minus. Uh, when you put Cl minus into water, the positive side of the water molecules lines up with the uh, negative ion and that stabilizes the negative ion. So the process of forming aqueous ions is a, an exothermic process and uh, this will release energy. So what we have here is we have this balancing act where the lattice energy plus the hydration energy, which again, this is positive and this is negative, is equal to what we call the heat of solution. And so this is delta H of the process where we have NaCl solid goes to NaCl, Na plus aqueous plus Cl minus aqueous. So we have to do both of these things. We have to break apart the ions and then hydrate them. And so if you combine those two processes in Hess's law, you will get the heat of solution, which is the delta H for this process. And so what winds up happening is, is if delta H is greater than zero, so if our process is exothermic, so this is our heat of solution, uh, I'm sorry, so if delta H is greater than zero, we're endothermic, and so that means that when we dissolve our salt into water, it causes the solution to cool down. It needs extra energy. That means that the lattice energy, which is the endothermic process, must have been greater than the, hyd the hydration energy, and vice versa. If delta H is less than zero, and this is exothermic, then we can, we can kind of interpret this as the lattice energy being less than the hydration energy. So now let's think about what the trends are for lattice energy and hydration energy. And so normally, I know uh, a lot of times this comes up, a lot of students start to get worried because the trends are sort of um, compatible in a way, meaning, you know, uh, lattice energy and hydration energy sort of trend together in a sense in a lot of ways. So it does make it a little bit hard to predict the overall um, trend in terms of the lattice energy plus the hydration energy. But normally when we ask you these questions, we basically say, just consider one factor. So for example, we would say, if lattice energy were the only factor, predict the solubility, the trend in solubility of these uh, ionic compounds, or vice versa. If we were, to, we might say, you know, if hydration energy were the only factor, predict the trends in uh, solubility for these compounds. So generally, you won't be asked to consider both. You'll just be asked to consider one or the other. So if we go back to our, our, our understanding of lattice energy, which comes from uh, chapter nine um, back in the first semester, we remember that the lattice energy increases with an increase in the charge of the ions. 
So for example, um, things like sodium plus, potassium plus, and ammonium plus, these are generally soluble. But if we increase the charge to things like PO4 3 minus or CO3 2 minus, these are generally insoluble. And this is due to the lattice energy. So as the lattice energy increases, as we increase the charge of the ions, and this causes a decrease in solubility. And the reason for the decrease in solubility is because obviously the higher the lattice energy there is, uh, the more of a burden it is to break those ions apart. And then there's one other trend in lattice energy. So lattice energy tends to increase when we decrease the ionic radii. And so for example, um, we have, uh, if we were to put lithium fluoride, sodium fluoride, uh, potassium fluoride, rubidium fluoride, and cesium fluoride, and we go and we look at the solubility of those, what we tend to find is that the cesium is the most soluble compared to the rubidium, compared to the potassium, compared to the sodium, and compared to the lithium. And the reason for this is because uh, lithium has the smallest ionic radius, um, whereas cesium has the largest ionic radius. And so because of that, the lithium and the fluoride can, tight, can pack more tightly together in the ionic network and therefore strong, form stronger ionic bonds. Whereas cesium is so big compared to the fluoride that they can't pack very efficiently and so that you don't get these very strong ionic bonds because there's a very, very big mismatch in the, um, in the size of the ions. Okay, so with hydration energy, we're gonna see that hydration energy tends to uh, have similar sort of trends uh, it, it, along the lines of lattice energy. So it turns out that hydration energy tends to increase as you increase the ion charge. So if you were thinking about hydration energy as being a sole factor, larger ions tend to be uh, tend to have more stable hydration energies because if you think about it, a big ion can pack a lot of water molecules around it to stabilize that 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 charge. So uh, increasing ion charge leads to you know increased hydration energy because you can get more water you get more water molecules around it to stabilize it. Um, and the same thing goes with uh, the ion size. So the hy hydration energy in this case uh, increases with decreasing ion size. So this is a bit different from the lattice, ener uh, from lattice energy. So meaning uh, if, when ion size decreases here, you get higher hydration energy. And that's because when you put a small ion into water, um, the water molecules can sort of organize themselves around it um, more efficiently. So you get an increase in the hydration energy. So now typically what you have to know is you'd have to know these trends for um, either the lattice energy or for the hydration energy. Typically we don't ask you to consider both at the same time. And so in this case we would get uh, something that's, that's an increase in solubility just based on the hydration energy. And in this case we would get an increase in solubility just based on the hydration energy. So that goes over solubility and some general trends, uh, some things that we bring back from our understanding of you know, chapter nine, where we talked about bonding. We introduced this idea of hydration energy, which we kind of talked about in chapter four. Um, so now you can make some predictions about, um, you can make some predictions about solubility. Um, and you can also think about what, with, in terms of the heat of solution, if it's endothermic or exothermic, what factor might be more important, the lattice energy or the hydration energy?